In this short video, we're going to talk about parametric surfaces. Let's start with a refresher about curves. Now, a curve, even a space curve, is really just a one-dimensional object. You can measure its length. We have arc length. But there's no thickness, there's no area, there's no volume associated with a curve. So it makes sense that we can write down a parametric representation of a curve using a vector where each component is just a function of a single parameter t. It really indicates that it's just a one-dimensional object. So let's extend this idea to surfaces. A surface is really just a two-dimensional object. Sure, you can measure its area, but you really can't measure its volume. Now, don't get confused when you have a closed surface like a sphere. The interior of a closed surface could be a solid. Now, solids have volume, but the surface is just a two-dimensional object. So since it's a two-dimensional object, it would make sense that we could find a parametric representation of a surface, which we could write down as a vector, where each component depends on two parameters, because we have two dimensions. And really what we're looking at here when we rewrite it in terms of u and v is we're doing a change of variables. So a lot of the things that we do with parametric surfaces should remind you of our analysis that we did when we were studying the change of variables in order to find or evaluate double integrals. So let's start by identifying a surface from its parametric representation, or from a parametric representation of the surface. Because one thing we're going to see very quickly is that, just like with curves, there is no unique parametric representation of a surface. 30 different people could come up with 30 different parametric representations of the same surface. Let's take a look at this one. Our x component is just u squared. The y component is u times cosine of v. And the z component is u times sine of v. So whenever I see sines and cosines, one thing that I always want to look at is, can I take advantage of my Pythagorean identity? In other words, the fact that cosine squared v plus sine squared v equals 1. Well, in this case, if I take y squared plus z squared, I'll get u squared cosine squared v plus u squared sine squared v. Let me factor out that u squared. What's left in parentheses is my Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared v plus sine squared v equals 1. So really, all that is is u squared. But what is u squared in this parametric representation? u squared here is x. So this would mean that x equals y squared plus z squared. And we should recognize that as being a paraboloid. The axis of the paraboloid is the positive x-axis. Let's look at a second example where we're given a parametric representation. Now we're using different letters, S and T. And just like in, in uh, when we studied curves, the parameter is just a dummy variable. So here I could have used, I could have used U and V. I used S and T. I could have selected other variables as well, x and y, or a and b. 
variables, but here I've used S and T. And the Y, excuse me, the X component is three cosine of T. The Y component is just S. And the Z component is sine of T. And we have this restriction that S goes between negative one and one. So that really means that since Y equals S, y goes between negative 1 and 1. So again, I see a cosine of t in my x component, a sine of t in my z component. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and solve uh, for cosine of t. That would be x over 3. So x over 3 squared plus z squared, that's the same as cosine squared t plus sine squared t which is one. So what I have is, oh, and I should not forget that y is limited to go between negative one and one. So what I have is an equation of an ellipse, if this were just a plane curve, but it's not a plane curve. It lives in a space and so when we have a plane curve which extends along throughout space there, that's what we call a cylinder. This is an elliptic cylinder. It has this equation. If I were looking down the y-axis, it would be this ellipse. And uh, it goes between negative 1 and 1. So this is what it would look like. So let's go in the other direction. We're given uh, an, a surface or a description of a surface. And from that description, we want to write down a parametric representation. In this case, we're going to start with a simple geometric object, a plane. And we know that it's passing through a specific point and it contains these two vectors, meaning that these two vectors are parallel to that plane. So when we studied planes, we knew that that was enough information to uh, uniquely identify the plane. It's passing through this point. It's parallel to those two vectors. So what we did back then is we were interested in finding a Cartesian equation of the plane. And we did some work. All right. I'm calling this a long solution. You might say, that's ah, not too bad. And, and by this point, hopefully, you remember how to do this. And it's not a lot of work. We would try to find an equation for the plane by finding a normal vector. So we would take A cross B and find a normal vector. And then take that normal vector, dot it with the position vector for our given point. That'll give us our right-hand side. And now we can write down an equation of the plane Cartesian equation, negative 3x minus 22y plus 7z is 57. And then what I can do is say, hmm, okay, solve that for z. And then I'll let u, I'm sorry, x equal u and y equal v. And then to find z, I'll just replace x with u and y with a v in my equation for z. And that'll give me a parametric representation. Now, here I used u and v. But really, that was kind of an extra step. I could have just worked with x and y as my parameters. So I could have written this as uh, x equals x, y equals y, z equals this equation, which is a function of x and y. And as a vector, then I would just write it as r of x comma y equals x comma y. And then this equation involving x and y. So it's the same. In this case, it's just the same parametric representation using different dummy parameters or dummy variables. Here I used u and v, and here I used x and y. I could have used s and t, or w and something else, 
a similar variable. But I consider this um, kind of too much work. There's actually a shorter way we can go about this. Because this plane is determined by that fixed point and those two vectors, we can write the position vector of any point in the plane as the sum of the position vector of my starting point plus some scalar multiple of the first vector plus another scalar multiple of the second vector. Get anywhere in this plane, that's all I need to do. And so then I could just write that as the position vector plus a parameter times the vector a plus another parameter times the vector b. Go ahead and write that as a single vector. And there is a different parametric representation of this plane. But I think it was a lot less work. All right, here we're given the equation of an ellipsoid. And we're interested in a parametric representation of the portion of this ellipsoid, which lies to the left of the XC plane. So left of the XC plane uh, really means that um, that y is negative. And OK, well, I have an ellipsoid, um, and I have uh, you know, a bunch of things that are squared, and it actually winds up equaling 1. But there's three terms that equal 1. So I can't directly take advantage of a Pythagorean identity, but I can indirectly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to let x equals r, r cosine theta z equals r sine theta over radical 3. So there's got to be two questions that come to mind, maybe even more. Uh, first of all, OK, x equaling r cosine theta, that makes sense. Why don't I use y? Well, remember that y is going to be negative, right? We have a restriction on y. So I'm going to. Uh, set y aside, because that's the one, uh, the variable that has the restriction. So I'll use z squared. Now, why did I write it this way? Uh, well, again, I want uh, x squared plus z squared um, to have a cosine squared plus sine squared, or not x squared plus z squared, x squared plus 3z squared. So if I were to set the uh, x squared to be r cos theta, and I want 3z squared to be r sine theta, then that would mean that uh, z squared would be r sine that to be squared. OK. And so that's why I need to have this divisor by radical 3. And I guess the next question would be, why do I need to have the r there? In other examples, I just use either some number times cosine theta, uh, or I just use plain old cosine theta. And the reason is because in the previous examples, like in the cylinder, or the, uh, yeah, in the cylinder, we could say that uh, x and z uh, were uh, their, the x squared plus 3z squared was equaling a constant. But here, x squared plus 3z squared is changing. It would wind up being 1 minus 2y squared. So that's why I need that second parameter are in there. 
All right, but I can still take advantage of that. X squared plus three Z squared is R squared cosine theta plus three R squared sine squared theta over three. So let's go ahead and multiply that out. So now you can see again why we had that radical three in the denominator. That way I'm left with just r squared sine squared theta. I can factor the r squared out. And so that would give me r squared. So now I can rewrite my original equation and replace the x squared plus 3z squared with r squared. And now again, this is why I left y by itself, because I'm going to solve for y but I'm going to take the negative square root. And again, why the negative square root? Because we're taking the portion of the ellipsoid which is to the left of the yz plane. And left of the yz plane means y must be negative. So I took the negative square root here. So a parameterization would be, well, x equals r cosine theta, z equals r sine theta, and then y is negative root 2 over 2 radical 1 minus r squared. Well, here's a second solution which might be a little bit more straightforward in the algebra. You may say to yourself, hey, I solved for uh, y uh, after converting to r and theta. Why convert to r and theta? Why not just leave everything in terms of x and z? So sure enough, I could do that. I could solve for y. Remember, negative square root, because we're on the left side of the x e plane where y is negative. And so, Another parameterization would be, well, just keep x and z as my parameters. Write y as a function of x and z by solving the equation for y. And that'll give me an, another parameterization of this portion of the ellipsoid. Now let me go back for a minute. So which one would you use? Well, it really depends on what type of analysis you're going to do and how comfortable you are working with um, each one of these uh, particular uh, parameterizations. So uh, if I'm going to be taking you know, partial derivatives or something like that, it may be simpler to use one of these rather than the, the other. And sometimes you can't um, really tell ahead of time. You may have to spend some time working with it. And even if one is not easier than the other, they're very different. So it would give you a chance to be able to check your work. If you do some kind of analysis, like we'll see we're going to find a tangent plane, uh, or maybe we're going to calculate some surface area. If you do some sort of analysis uh, using uh, this surface, and you get the same result using two very different parameterizations, that gives you really a lot of confidence that your analysis is correct. Let's do another example. Here we have a parametric representation of a portion of a cylinder. Right? So now x squared plus z squared is a constant. And we're only going to take the portion which is above the x y plane. So z is positive. x can be positive or negative, but z is only positive. And we're taking the portion of this cylinder between y equals negative 4 and y equals 4. So we could go back and use um, our Pythag Pythagorean identity for cosine and sine. So in this case, I don't need the r because x can be 3 cosine theta, uh, z can be 3 sine theta, and y can just be y, my second parameter. 
And, we, and the reason is, again, that x squared plus z squared is a constant. It doesn't vary. And y, whenever you have this restriction, you should get into the habit of writing it down whenever you write down a representation of the surface. So I'm always going to write down, oh, for this surface, that y goes between negative 4 and 4. So the two parameters that I'm using in this representation are theta and y. So I would have r of theta comma y, and then uh, being 3 cosine theta y and 3 sine theta. And the parameterization is incomplete if I don't include this restriction on the y parameter. So in solution two, I'm going to solve this for z. Now, why did I choose z? Why didn't I choose solve for x? Well, I can write z as a function of x because when we're only using the positive square root of z, which is needed. If I try to solve for x, I need to have a plus and minus in front of the radical sign, which would not be a function. And that is one thing that is true. All of these component functions, well, they have to be functions. So I couldn't have a plus or minus in front of a square root in a parametric representation. I would no longer have a function. So that's fine. I'll just solve for z. And so then my two parameters are going to be x and y. So I would have x equals x, y equals y, z equals uh, radical 9 minus x squared, and only the positive square root, because we're only looking at the portion above the yz plane. And of course, I have to include the bounds on y. y goes between negative 4 and 4. So in vector form, I would write this as r of x comma y is my first component x, second component function y, third component function radical 9 minus x squared. And again, it's incomplete unless I include the restriction on y, that y goes between negative 4 and positive 4. Now, parametric representations are actually really useful if we want to write down or do some, write down an equation for or do some analysis with surfaces of revolution. Remember from, this is from back in Calc 1. If I take the curve y equals f of x going between a and b, so I have this blue curve, and I'm going to take this portion between a and b and rotate it around the x-axis. So I'll get a surface of revolution when I do that. And uh, we'd like to find a parametric representation of that. Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, we're going to use x and theta as our parameters. So obviously x is restricted to go between a and b. And so to represent this circular portion, the revolution portion, we're just going to take the y value, so written as a function of x, times cosine theta, and the y value times sine theta. Let's do an example where we do that. We're going to take the curve y equals cube root of x between uh, 0 and 1, x goes between 0 and 1, rotate that about the x-axis. You get a surface that reminds us of a paraboloid, but it's not, because y doesn't equal, or I'm sorry, x doesn't equal y squared. x equals y cubed. So this is like a paraboloid, looks like a paraboloid, but it's not. It's a surface of revolution. So a parametric representation of this would be to let x equal x, y is going to be the cube root of x times cosine theta, and z is going to be the cube root of x times sine theta. Now this is a convenient way of writing it, um, but you know I could have had, and 
uh, I could have swapped the sine theta and the cosine theta, it would still give me a parametric representation of this particular uh, surface. And again, uh, the parametric representation is incomplete if I don't include any bounds on my parameters. And in this case, my x parameter is bounded by 0 and 1. And I'm just going to go ahead and bound theta between 0 and 2 pi. So we only go once around the x axis. So in vector form, I would have this representation here. So now we have many examples of parametric surfaces. How can we use this to help us analyze these surfaces? That's what we're going to do in the next video.